Despite over 700 men having been lost in the first 25 years of the submarine force, there was still no means for submariners trapped on the bottom to rescue themselves or be rescued by others. Luck had saved the men of the S-5, the S-48, and the O-5. But now, luck would change. September 25th, 1925. A young lieutenant named Charles Mumson was commanding his submarine, the S-1, off the coast of Rhode Island when an emergency call came in. The S-1 and her crew were ordered to speed to the last known location of the S-51 and help any survivors. Minutes before, the S-51 had been rammed by the merchant ship City of Rome, sinking the S-51 in minutes. City of Rome had picked up the only three survivors she could find and sped for shore. The S-1 was now ordered to seek out her stricken sister. Mumson and his crew made all speed, but when they got there, all they found was the marker buoy City of Rome had left behind, an oil slip and no men. Mumson realized that there was nothing he and his crew could do. There was no way to lift the S-51. There was no way to even locate them. They would have to save themselves. They would have to force a portion of their boat to surface before Mumson's crew could even help them topside. And as time went on, it became obvious that wasn't going to happen. Mumson had personal experience with being trapped underwater. During the summer of 1923, his first command, the O-15, practiced a full-speed dive when her bow planes jammed and she buried her nose in the mud. No one knew where they were, and no one would come looking for them for hours. It was only by filling the bow torpedo tubes with seawater and firing those blanks back out that the O-15 finally floated free. Mumson knew they had been incredibly lucky that time. But apparently the S-51's luck was not the same. It took 10 months to locate and raise her. Among her crew had been Mumson's good friend, Lieutenant James Hazelton, a classmate from the Naval Academy and Submarine School. While he circled the S-51's grave above, Mumson thought of Hazelton and tried to comfort himself with the idea that at least Hazelton and his crewmates had died quickly. To Mumson's horror, however, once the S-51 was raised, there was evidence some of the crew had died long after she hit bottom. When Hazelden was found, his fingers were badly torn and damaged, evidence he had died trying to force open a hatch sealed shut under tons of pressure. He'd known he was trapped and died desperately trying to save himself and his crew. Mumson started planning and sketching. His first idea was a type of diving bell, which could be lowered from a surface ship and carry the crew off the sub. To connect the two, a large metal ring could be welded around the hatch of the submarine, allowing a good seal between the two vessels. He sent these drawings, along with recommendations from other submarine commanders, up to the Bureau of Construction Repair, but heard nothing. Mumson was soon transferred to, of all places, the Bureau of Construction and Repair. He looked into his drawings and found impractical from the point of seamanship scrawled across the top. All the work, all of the support from his fellow commanders, and it had come to nothing. He restated his case, the absolute need for such a device, but was ignored. Two years passed, and then luck ran out again, this time very publicly. December 7, 1927, the S-4, practicing off the coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, surfaced right in the path of the Coast Guard cutter Paulding. The S-4 sank quickly, most of her crew still alive, in just 110 feet of water. Night was coming, and the seas were cold. By the time salvage divers arrived the next morning, they tapped along the length of the hull. Evidence would later show most of the crew had died during that first night from hypothermia or chlorine gas. But in the forward torpedo room, six men tapped back. Please, hurry. The winter weather whipped up, but the salvage divers worked frantically to attach air hoses and start the lift lines. 
the fierce seas kept pulling the hoses away from the S-4. The nation was riveted to this story, listening to the latest updates on their radios, following each new development in the newspaper. For nearly two days, the divers worked around the clock, but the tapping became weaker as the messages grew more desperate. Is there any hope? The survivors tapped. The divers kept checking with them as they struggled with the hoses. Finally, one more weak message. We understand. No more tapping came, and the winter storms finally forced the rescue effort back to shore. It would be four months before the S-4 could be raised, and the public flooded the Navy with letters demanding that submarines be scrapped or demanding why no one had thought of a way to rescue these men. Ironically, Mumson's job was to answer these letters, all while knowing what could have saved the S-4's crew. With new fervor, Mumson brought the idea of the bell up again, and this time, the Navy listened. Mumson also had a new invention he'd been working on independently, a lung that would allow submariners too far from help to escape their own boat. 